You're listening to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 40. This week, we are reviewing Thunder Alley, along with Castle Panic, the Summoner Wars Master Set, and Glory to Rome. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, a podcast about gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Anthony. This is Chris. This is Daniel. And this is Drew. Welcome to the episode, everybody. Episode 40. This week we're going to be looking at Thunder Alley, Fresco, a couple other cool games we got to the table. Um, also got a couple of cool acquisition disorders, including a long favorite that's been out of print for a while, and now it's semi-affordable. Uh, but first things first, we want to talk about the Extra Life event coming up in just three weeks now. So if you're in Jersey, New York, anywhere in the area, and you can make it to Saddlebrook on Ac- October 26th, we'll be having our 12-hour gaming marathon there. Uh, lots of cool stuff's going to happen. They're bringing in extra games. Got a lot of people, a lot of different gaming groups coming in around the area. Um, last year, we had a really cool event, raised a lot of money for children's hospitals. Uh, this year, we've got games for raffles. We've got special events planned. It's going to be really cool. This is part of a national a national thing. Um, may not be aware of it, but... You listeners out there in listener land, <laughs> you guys are aware of it, um, may not be aware, but this is a national thing that Extra Life, this organization called Extra Life is doing for Children's Miracle Network. Um, and second year that we've done it locally, it, it is a blast. It's something, an opportunity for gamers to, to uh, give to kids who need it. And if you can't make it down to New Jersey, there's still a way to kind of contribute to children's hospitals you want to check out the Board Gamers Anonymous website, and there's all the details and information that you need to do. Yep. Uh, instructions there on where to donate, who to contact if you want to get involved. Um, and thank you in advance for being a part of this awesome charity. All right, so that's coming up in three weeks. But for now, let's take a look at the news. Shout it from the tabletop. Corny, I know. I'll come up with something like better someday. Top, 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 top. I top, put an echo. <laughs> I forgot this a couple weeks ago. Uh, this little bit of news came under the radar, but Hasbro is no longer the number one giant in the toy and game industry anymore. They have been knocked off by a company that only makes one thing, but they make it well. Lego is now number one in the world. I'm cool with that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> That's a company I can get behind. Well, I'm just tired of Hasbro buying up all these other, you know, treasured old game companies. Um, they have all these things going on, but it doesn't beat one thing you do and you do it well, and that's enough to keep you on top. Um, they also do movies well. Hasbro hasn't figured out how to yeah. <laughs> do that one thing well and then make a best-selling movie about how awesome that one thing yeah. is <laughs> and how all good people should want to do that one thing, and then you'll be successful somehow. <laughs> Surprise. Well, it's incredible. I mean, all Lego did was take this Minecraft idea and apply it to the real world and create all these bricks and, and give them to people to make. You could make anything. It's like having Minecraft in your hand. To make anything you want. They were Minecraft before Minecraft was Minecraft. <laughs> a little bit backwards. Minecraft took this Lego idea and moved it to the virtual world. But think, how much, uh, how much did Microsoft pay for Minecraft? Oh, a billion lot of dollars. Money, dollar. Yeah. So that shows you the proof of concept. Yes. Yeah. People like building stuff. Mm-hmm. Give them some. Especially some... my 14 year old sister. <laughs> Give them some simple bricks, whether they're actual physical bricks or metaphysical, and you can create the world. It just goes to show about gaming and toys. People are still looking to engage their imagination and not just have everything kind of played out for them on a screen. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. Because I'm a, I'm a Lego guy from way back. I had a bunch of... I had a box full of blocks. There were no um, <laughs> Star Wars, you know... Sure. Kits. There was nothing. You just had these basic schematics, and you you build it yourself. Um, and that's really, I think, what the Lego movie was was saying. I think they sort of trashed their own idea. It's like they create their own kits, and now they're telling people ignore the kits, just make whatever you want. And that's and that happens a lot these days with marketing. It's not about creating a new product. It's about rebranding an old product with an IP. 
And it, and as you said, Joe, there is some downside to it because since you're prescribing these bricks, which are supposed to be complete freedom to almost do anything yeah. you want, now it's really gearing you to build one thing, even though you can kind of reconstitute it. it I've seen that too. I, I remember growing up with some of the sets, like... I think even in the Lego movie, it had the Spaceman set. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I want to build a spaceship. I want to build a spaceship. Build a spaceship. But beyond that, you know, you had blocks and you could kind of make whatever you want. Well, and I think the the, 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 the story they're trying to tell there, they're like, at the end, President Business is the greatest master builder, right? <laughs> He's the one who follows the rules. He's the one who made the rules, sure. right? And he uh-huh. is the greatest. But it's a wonderful thing that everyone's riffing on what he did. So it's this sort of combination of use this, get the schematic, and then feel free to break it, play with it, do whatever you want with it. But the schematics, the rules, the the instructions still have a role, right? And that's the problem that the purely creative master builders had at the beginning, right? Is they wouldn't think within any sort of rule set. And so with having just a little bit of rules and then just a bit of imagination playing back and forth, you get something really wonderful awesome yeah it, it's enduring so many decades have been around good for lego um another quick uh announcement bit of news there are more honors seems like every couple of weeks there's new awards being handed out um in germany of course they hand out more awards than anybody the deutsche spiel prize was given to russian railroads so it's it's a prize that's given out to gamers games good innovative wordplay and they actually rank them in order so russian railroads was first followed by istanbul concordia Love letter, and Camel Up. Um, give you an idea of uh, give you an idea of past winners: Terra Mystica, Seven Wonders, Fresco, Dominion. That's the kind of kind of games. This is like a people's award. Stores, magazines, game clubs, they all vote for that. They also had a Kinderspiel prize for a game called Fire Dragon, and then the famous Essen Feather Award was given to a Bluxen. That's for uh, best written rules. Good. Something we appreciate. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Rules. <laughs> um, yet German is a real difficult language to write rules in, mm. especially with their compound. Um, oh, you know the compound words. They just like um, just tack on words. They you know, like to make a lot of words up. Studying German philosophy, they just make things up. Yeah. So it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> the next award, there's more coming. The International Gaming Awards the next two, three weeks. Um, I know I saw the um, the list. It's not all that international. I think there's only one American game, and they're okay. most all European. But that'll be interesting to see. The Strong Museum of Play in Rochester has their annual Toy Hall of Fame awards that uh, visitors to the website, visitors to the museum can nominate. Uh, there are 12 items on that list, only one of which is a game operation. Okay. So if if they let uh, people vote, then go to their website and pump up operation. It's I, I appreciate what uh, you got to be careful about that because if you vote for operation, it's possible that you might set it off. So you got to be careful. <laughs> be, be really careful when you, when you go that slowly. Button. Yeah, That's very right. carefully. That's the you. trick to it. But uh, I, I I think the Strong Museum of Play has a great a great purpose. But their goal primarily seems to be toys. They just don't have a lot of room for games. And operations really, operation is a toy. It's a gimmick. It's a toy. Yeah, it's, it's not just a, a gimmick. It's not so much of a game. Well, there's skill. It's it's one of the a very small number of manipulation games. We don't really see a lot of them. It's a dexterity game, right? Yeah, yeah. dexterity, like Jenga, basically. So why wouldn't Jenga be nominated? <laughs> Maybe someday. Someday. Um, well, here's how slow they are in catching up. Last year, one of the two award winners of game uh, or of the Hall of Fame was chess. So they're they're. You start a new Hall of Fame, you got to start with the basics. You, can't, you know, you can catch up. I guess. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I hear about. I hear this chess game. You know, people have been talking about it. Might be something yeah. I want to look at. I want to check this out. I feel like this is the game, the, the toy or game equivalent of when you send someone an award in real life and they don't even bother to show up <laughs> because they just have so many. So who, who shows up for chess? <laughs> who <can> represent <laughs> chess? Yeah. Who's the creator? <laughs> well, here's their description. Inductees to the Hall of Fame have to be uh, proven to be more than just a fad. Well, chess is kind of... I know, know. it it comes and goes. (laughs) Foster learning, creativity, or discovery through play. And, yeah, chess, if you think about it, it's not just grandmasters, you know, hunched over a board, but kids love playing it. There's variations and and puzzles, and you can play with chess. 
it's a great game. You can do a lot with it. Yeah. Um, Dungeons and Dragons news. There's always something going on. Um, right now, they're t- it's in the news for two different things. The rights for the movies and rights for the board games. We'll take the good news first. Um, board game rights have been given to WizKids. And they're, they're going to start launching a series of board games in 2015. It's the movie rights that are interesting because this little company, Sweet Pea, is fighting this other little company, Hasbro, <laughs> for the movie rights. And it seems like a, a David and Goliath thing. They're, they've gone to court, but the, uh, the argument's already been heard, and the judge is going to take a sweet time in deciding it, but he's in, imploring the two sides to come to agreement before then, because I don't think the judge wants to touch this. Um, so he's been urging a settlement for that. I don't know how that's going to be settled. How would Hasbro... You roll a 20 to- side die, and if, it, if, <laughs> if, if you're successful, you win the court case. I mean, come on, Drew. Oh, this is ha- pretty simple. Hasbro has the plus five uh, shield of <laughs> invincibility. <laughs> well, remember, size redu- being higher in the size category reduces your armor class. Oh, uh, that's true, so too. Your and your, li- bigger, bigger your liability class? Yeah, your liability yeah. class. Yeah. <laughs> Hasbro has more to lose. Yeah. Have... But does it really matter? No. Have D and D have D and D movies ever really made any impact? I mean, what's... or any money? They're yeah. No, <laughs> they've been terrible. Absolutely horrible. And it's not like you couldn't do a D and D movie without calling it a D and D movie, right? It's just a generic high fantasy setting. Yeah. There's, there's nothing. Whereas special there's, about the name. I think a lot more of the board games, obviously, Lords of Waterdeep, for example, have been far more successful, had bigger impact. I think they need to think when they do a movie. They, they need to think small scale. And the problem with the D and D universe is everything's big and CG. So mm. usually they don't have enough money to do those things well. So it tends to be kind of a mess. At least the final product. Yeah, but imagine you know the old fashioned D and D was the, this. It was a really complex dungeon crawl with tension and uh, you know suspense and you know you really had to be problem solving they could make a great movie out of just a dungeon crawl focused uh, real small like a micro yes focused on these individuals and the, and the problem they don't need special effects like you said lords of war deep is you can directly compare that to game of thrones it's all these powers that are kind of jockeying for position under yeah, false pretenses and other people, and yeah, so. not a lot of special effects. No, it? so they, well, if they intended to capitalize on certain certain parts of the universe, they, it might end up mattering. So if they end up doing the Gritzed series, they could expect to get a significant following behind that because mm. the book series has has a significant following. If they were to use stuff from like the Eberron world lore, that's interesting enough to leverage a movie. But if they're just gonna do another quote unquote D and D movie that has absolutely nothing to do with anything. Extravaganza <laughs> It was just it, it was terrible. Like, well they try to hit all four quadrants. So they try yeah. to bring in every population yeah. to like the movie. And it's like, hey comic relief and this is for the kids. Like, no, don't do that. No, I think it, yeah, you gotta get micro to be successful. Gotta zoom in. Um, other big news from Kickstarter. Um, this this will affect people who launch Kickstarter, but it also affects us who look at Kickstarter and invest money in Kickstarter. They change their terms of service to try and shine a brighter light on the responsibilities that Kickstarter projects have toward people who invest. So they're saying, this is what we expect of you. This is what you have to do. And if you're not on time, this is what's going to happen. The bottom line is, though, there's nothing we as investors can do to, to change anything. If there's a problem... We can go to the FTC and we can alert them and the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, can then take action. So it's... And that's been a big problem. We talked about this over so many different episodes where there's been projects that have failed spectacularly or just have never come through. And it really does hurt the hobby because you do put your time, money and interest and faith into these games, into these publishers, into these designers. And when they don't come through or the product is very poor, you don't just get turned off of that particular game. You get turned off the hobby. Yeah. So we don't want to lose, you know, all the big fans like we are of the hobby. We want to bring new people in and having inferior products, having poor production, having products that don't come out on time. I mean, there is threads on top of threads in Board Game Geek that just covers the fact that these games never reach fulfillment in whatever way. It's really, yeah, it's creating such bad... Uh... PR and Philip Dubarry has been 
suffered from that recently in his yes. his launch, barely making his goal because the the company he's associated with. Now, if only there was a podcast, Drew, that could kind of help our listeners guide that process. Gee, guys, do you know of any any uh, podcast like that? <laughs> no one's gonna step forward, Chris. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think, uh, no, no, no. Kicking the There's habit. That one guy. That one guy. <laughs> you know that guy. Kicking, guy. Kicking, that guy. Kicking that the guy. Kicking the habit with Chris Garbone, part Woo. of the Board Gamers Anonymous Podcast Network. Kicking the habit. <laughs> Hey Kickers, this is your moderator Chris, and on episode 16, I have four amazing campaigns to bring you, and one campaign that recently wrapped up. So, get a good night's sleep, and then wake up on October 7th, 2014, and pick which campaign you think is responsible for what just occurred. I'll see you then. Acquisition Disorder Corner. All right, so I'll kick things off here. Uh, so one of the games that at our old game store that was always sitting up on the shelf that everybody would look at, and I actually have no idea how this plays because I've never touched it, <laughs> but it was like the Holy Grail in the room because it cost $300. Oh. <laughs> exactly. It was Space Hulk. Um, and surprisingly, they went through like four or five copies of that because someone would come in and buy it like every four months or so. Mm-hmm. Um why where they got the money i don't know but this is like the big you know they don't make a ton of board games in general um so when they do it's it's a big game they hear is games workshop yes yeah. yes so games workshop um uh, you know they have this game they have dread fleet they have a couple of others and they're all just like exceptionally high quality miniatures usually a two-player game of some sort um and this is one of the ones that they've had. And the original publication was like 1980-something. So it's been around for a long time. But now they are finally re-released it again, even though they said they would never do it again. <laughs> but they're doing it again. It's like the Rolling Stones. Yeah. <laughs> so in a fourth edition um, for $125. Wow. So that's oh, wow. People have been looking for the $300 version. This is a affordable version. Um, all the online orders are sold out already, but uh, stores have it in stock. So, so what did they change to lower that price that much? That is the retail price. The retail oh. price five years ago was a hundred, so they okay. actually raised the price. Okay, just the secondary market it was three hundred. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, it's a really good game that everybody wants, and they don't print very many copies. And the only people you can buy it from are Games Workshop, and unless someone goes out and buys it from Games Workshop and resells it, because they don't usually distribute their stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, somebody said that they were looking for it. One one source that was selling it sold out by the end of the day. I mean, it was just gone. Boom. Anything online is sold out. Like, yeah. uh, they say there are some in stores, if you go to a Games Workshop store. Um, I don't know how many of those are around anymore. They used to be all over the place. We have one in Manhattan that I know of around us. But um, if you're not in the UK, I don't know how many of those stores are actually out there. But it is. It looks awesome. I mean, it's always something I wanted to try, and so now I'm on the fence whether to give it a shot because it's. And this is due in part to the the new release of their app, so you can actually play this on an iPad, and it's been very successful as far as getting purchases of it. But it's been quasi successful as being a good translation to the you know the online game kind of platform. Oh, I mean, the app just doesn't. It doesn't really hold the, the real fun that the, uh, yeah. the board game actually does, but it's it's decent, especially if you want to see what the gameplay's like. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to give it a shot. If I if I happen to stop in a games workshop and they happen to have it, I might grab it, just because if nothing else, it'll be five more years before they reprint it <laughs> yeah. for the last time, but probably not until it's... they decide to do it again because they're still going to make money off of it time. Are they like um, the Disney you know, back in the vault for oh five God, years. Yeah. <laughs> some, were... some games deserve to go back in the vault, and this is not one of them. Keep printing it so I can find it. Uh, but yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. It's cool that it came out. Um, I, I have, uh, for my acquisition disorder, another Munchkin game. Um, I think that there's a growing groundswell of, of pushback against Steve Jackson for this uh, eternal procession of Munchkin games. But on the other hand, there's pushers back of the pushback saying, you know, Steve Jackson earned this. He paid his dues. Um, 
and he puts out other great games. So let him have his uh, his payday with Munchkin. Uh, as long as the the Munchkin games are humorous and delightful to look at and play, this time it's Munchkin Gloom. I happen to to like Gloom. I always liked the Edward Gorey kind of artwork. Mm-hmm. Uh, Love that part of it. And now I can't wait to see what what twist. What's the artist who does John Kovalik? Yeah, what he does with with all of this. But I like the gloom gameplay, so I want to see how the Munchkin uh, look overlays over that. I always like their cards, the gloom cards, how they kind of lay over each other. That, yeah, that transparency. transparent. See, that was a really great idea. I hope they try to incorporate that maybe in a in a little bigger kind of format. You know, lay di- different classes or weapons, or however they kind of place everything together. Well, so much of it is storytelling. Um, you, these the the cards in Gloom are dark, hard to read. Yes, but you're supposed to read them and create a story out of them. <laughs> and it and a lot of times, I and and the other people who play with me, we just skip the story and it's just a game of strategy. Um, I would love to see that storytelling element come back, and I hope that Munchkin Gloom does that. It would be yeah, fun. That'd be good because without the storytelling, Gloom is not a very good game. No, no. no. All right, so I want to talk about an acquisition I have. We talked about this extensively. In our versus episode, number 35, Cyclades versus Kemet. Now, Cyclades has just announced that they're going to come out with a new expansion, Titans. Now, in Titans, it's going to give you a couple of different components you can add to the game. So, first off, the standard additional player. So, now you can play as Purple. Yay! <laughs> Purple's oh, always good to play. God. <laughs> <laughs> Some people haven't listened to episode 35. They might want to hear your review. Let him have his acquisition disorder. <laughs> Let Nobody me... says you have to play it. <laughs> Let me be okay with my games, Daniel. Let me be okay. <laughs> Maybe this will actually fix it for you. You know. Adding another flair. No, probably. well, that's not... the rest. That's not the rest. But, Daniel, that's not all. That's not all. <laughs> but there's more. <laughs> so, not only will you get the additional player, but there will also be rules to play as teams. So you can play six players, or you can play with you know teams of players, which adds a little kind of strategy for that. Um, it also has new boards and new artwork for the boards. I know the artwork was a little bit challenging, but a little, little twist on that. And the artwork on the boards actually has environmental type of you know different environments on there, so that's kind of interesting. There'll also be new wing conditions for the game, so that's a little interesting. So it'll have divine artifacts, so it actually has little miniatures of these different greek mythology type of artifacts and if you are able to collect all of them you can win the game that way so another another way in which you can win the game the metropolises which are the victory condition if you collect two actually will have additional abilities too and different types of functions throughout the game so it's actually opening the game up to different ways of playing the game now in particular you're picking this game up because it's about the titans the titans actually come with really really super cool miniatures that are actually bigger than the troops so, and they'll actually play in the game for the entire game. Nice. So one of the big criticisms mm-hmm. of Cyclades is you get these really cool miniatures, they have an interesting effect, but then they kind of come out of the game. So these these warriors, these titans, will come into the game and stay in the game, which is nice. So a lot of difference here, some additional cards in the game, additional gameplay, could actually kind of open this up you know, to Daniel falling in love with this game. Could happen. It, it is theoretically possible. <laughs> hey, hey, it does sound like these things address like at least three of the four things you didn't like. Yeah, this, this sounds like a move in the right direction at the yeah. very least. I like the fact that the company was listening to our podcast and went ahead <laughs> and made these changes and put this expansion out for us particularly. And That was fast. Yeah. They made that game fast. They, they are big fans. They're like, what's going on? You know, and, you know, so. Yeah. This little... go. Asthma day. Good job. So we'll be looking forward to this when it comes out. Awesome. Yeah, I actually want to play that. That sounds cool. So you can drag Daniel to the table. One more Kicking time. Screaming. I'll give it a shot. We need I'll more than two shot. people. <laughs> no. Well, at the very least, we we do enjoy seeing you so happy in anticipation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How many games have philosophers in it, Daniel? Come on, be honest. Right? Come on, as a philosopher, you got to appreciate the fact that you're in a game. And they can help you win. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's move on then before this turns into a part two of the Cyclades reveal. <laughs> um, all of our scheduled programming is canceled so that I can complain about Cyclades for another hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> all 
All right, that's everything for this week uh, on the acquisition disorder front. Next up, we're going to look at some of the games we've been playing lately. At the table this week. All right, so at the table this week, uh, I know, Daniel, you got to the table a game that was super cheap but also super amazing. Yeah, yeah, so I picked up Summoner Wars uh, at the Barnes & Noble sale, the clearance sale, uh, and I had a friend who came over and crashed on, uh, at my apartment one night, and so we sat around and we played a round of Summoner Wars, and it was a lot of fun. It was very simple, very quick to learn. We got uh, into it very quickly, and it played out quickly. Um, my only real concern with it is it was very easy to learn, to the point that by around the fourth round, I knew exactly what his deck could do and my deck could do without ever having looked through either of them. Right, it's just, oh, yep, I got it. No, I understand what's going on here, right? Um, and so, you know, that with just the base set, I think it's a little too predictable and a little too stagnant. Uh, so I'll have to be looking for some expansion soon. Yeah, there are, what are they, through 18 factions? Yeah, something like that. And then there's the new alternative master set coming out with six more where they mashed up 12 mm-hmm. and to create, like, combo races. Um so they're gonna that'll bring it up to twenty four, and then there are reinforcement packs where you can customize all your decks, and they have those for basically every one of them. So the permutations here are ridiculous, and then the fact that like yeah, the game is a small deck, you can learn the cards for everybody's deck, but at the end of the day, they're still rolling dice. So I played games of this where you're like, all right, I'm gonna hit you, I'm gonna roll five dice, and I have to hit you on one of them. Nothing. You just crap out on the whole thing and that is immensely frustrating and it can happen in a game like this because you still have to roll the dice and the, the odds are always in your favor in terms of um like just the base attacks you, you know you have a four out of six chance of hitting but you also have a two and six chance of not so yeah I, I took the master set to be an excellent proof of concept more than a game like it's more of a no here's how the game plays Right, but this is like the tutorial level. There's no, this is not the real challenge. This is not the real game. The real game comes once you get these expansion packs and you throw in new factions or you start making your own decks and they start having different dynamics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's a brilliant introduction to miniature gaming. Yeah. Um, if you've never played a miniature game, you could get a lot of mileage out of the master set. Oh, yeah. Like, and like, I play this game with my wife multiple times and she loves it. And we just have the master set and i think two or three other decks i picked up Mm -hmm. i haven't customized a lot and it's not necessarily because it's simple it's just because we don't play a lot of games so it's something we can pull out immediately remember how to play even if we pick different decks and it takes five minutes to pick up yeah so it's a fun game the commons don't really do a lot in the game at least in the original sets but the expansion sets really bolster what the commons can do in the game because typically you're just using the commons for cannon fodder or to build your magic and then you bring in out your kind of main heroes but it's a great game. Yeah. yeah. Glad you bought it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very glad. And I'm probably going to pick up some expansion soon, but we'll see about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you get them on sale online, though. Six bucks a deck. That'd be so, great. Yeah. Nice. All right, cool. Um, so another game we got to the table just this last week. Again, this is yours, Daniel, but I'll yeah. steal your thunder for Go a minute. Go for it. <laughs> it's uh, Castle Panic. This is a game that I've... Um, it's been around forever. Everybody plays it. There's multiple versions of it. There's a zombie panic. There's a munchkin panic coming out. Um, <laughs> the game, and there's a lot of different kind of variants of it in different ways, but the basic idea is like tower defense in a board game. So you you have your little castle in the middle and a bunch of walls around it, and then monsters keep coming out, and you have to destroy them with various cards that you draw that attack in different rings. That's it. Uh, it's cooperative, and... Because of that, because everything's random, because of the dice, because you're drawing these things and you don't know what you're going to draw, and some of them, like, you'll draw four more, and then three more, and then four more, um, it can either be really hard, it seems like, or really easy. I don't, you know, it doesn't have that, like, perfect, that pitch-perfect difficulty of, you know, the more advanced, high-quality cooperative games that you see these days. Um, you want to give it credit, because it's one of the early co-ops to really hit it big, but it's... I, th- I think it's a little weak in terms of how that cooperative play actually plays out um, and has been done better in a couple other instances. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had rounds where I went and I like, draw three more, draw four more, draw three more, and just 
you grew the whole field filled with monsters. Well, we lose. And I've had other ones where you've got draw three, four, draw four more, draw three more, plague, 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 monsters move, mo- you know, clockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, <laughs> clockwise, counterclockwise, you're done. And it's just, you know, it's the last, the whole bottom of the cup just did nothing. And you're just, well, that was all of it, we win. Um, and so it can really swing in difficulty. Yeah, the game we played was relatively easy and yeah. we were not excited at all when we won it was like hey it's over yeah <laughs> and it wasn't like a bad game it was still entertaining to some degree but it was it's vanilla yeah. like there's no like there's no named characters there's nothing on anything you just have knights and archers and swordsmen i don't know you're really you're really expecting the deck to build the tension so if the deck kind of plays out you know it's, it's a typical co-op game so if the deck plays out so it seems very dangerous and you're not going to make it and you, you happen to pull it off, that's great. But as Daniel and Anthony were saying, the way the deck tends to play out is could be super simple or super difficult and you don't seem to have like any control and doesn't seem to be any, any story behind it. Now, this game is being printed in different versions. So on Kicking the Habit, we talked about Orcs, 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 which is a mage version of this where you'll be actually be able to play cards they have special abilities and they kind of ramped up the difficulty and in munchkin land there'll be munchkin panic which is a kind of a reskinning of castle panic but it also has some additional rules and kind of ways to play against the other players and so it's kind of semi-cooperative so they've taken this mechanic which i think is pretty cool i mean it looks it looks nice and you from a distance like to be able to see these chits in the game and the castle kind of built up is kind of fun. It just needs a little more to it. So hopefully these other versions kind of bring it up a step. Yeah, it's yeah. it looks cool in theory. And I think, like in my head, it's almost like Dominion. Like, we're the first one. Now everything else will iterate on that and we'll come back and we'll make a better version. Like, I would probably not play Dominion if there was options of other deck builders. I probably would not play Castle Panic if there were options of other co-ops. But if it was the only co-op and maybe I'm playing with family or something i think it's it can be fun i just wouldn't necessarily go out and buy it it's a play yeah. for me i'd play yeah, it. yeah i'd play it to play all right so last up on the uh, at the table list we have our classic this week courtesy of chris so i had the extraordinary opportunity and pleasure to play glory to rome now i played the fourth edition for this game this game has been out in multiple editions over the years this game originally came out in 2005 and most of our listeners probably will know this game for its recent Kickstarter Black Box Edition, which had its kind of clip art type of look to it. So now the edition I played had very cartoony artwork. And I have to thank uh, Nicole, the organizer for the New Jersey Board Gamers Meetup, for teaching this game because I really enjoyed this. This was a game that I really wanted to get to the table. I had seen this game kind of played at different spots, just never had a chance to sit down and play it. Now, if you haven't played To Glory to Rome, it would probably take a really long time to explain everything about this game because there's so many different mechanics. But if you've played Race for the Galaxy, if you've played San Juan, you've played these games before, and Glory to Rome is kind of the innovator of a lot of these different mechanics. Now, without getting into any too, any any major detail, it's you'll have a hand of cards, and the cards do a lot of different things. So on the bottom, it will have a material. On the left side, it will have a kind of clientele kind of special ability for that character. And on the top, it'll have information as far as influence and special ability on the card. So what you're trying to do is, as in every good Euro game, you're trying to build victory points throughout the game. There's a number of different ways to do it, and that's really the real fun of this game. So as the first player... I will play a card and that'll let me do a special ability based upon the card. Now the other players can choose to follow me by playing the same type of color card or they can think, which means they would be able to draw cards. As the game goes on, I can play the clients, I can play the cards under the left side, which will allow me later on to follow for free. So actually to perform that action. Same thing like Race for the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. The game is has a lot of different win conditions as I was talking about. So you're scoring points through influence, you're scoring points by having materials in your vault, but there are also cards in the game which allow you to win the game without having to do either one of those options. So I was building a a strategy that would allow me to win the game if I had a 
a client of every color in the game. So if I had all of those people lined up, I could win the game. I was one card away, but uh, everyone had a different way of playing. There was a number of different ways to win, and everyone enjoyed the game, and I'm really looking forward to playing this game. It's a buy for me. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going to go with the cartoony artwork, which really didn't connect with me because the game is quite heavy. And when I'm playing a Euro game that's heavy, I want more realistic kind of artwork. The Black Box, edi Black Box Edition is maybe a little too bland and vacant in some ways. So I guess whatever flavor you're looking for and, you know, the different versions have different artwork. So try to find the one that's right for you. But if I do see this on the shelf, I am absolutely picking this one up. It's hard to find though, right? It's still it's, out of print again? It's out of print again. <laughs> yeah. It looks like the cheapest version on BoardGameGeek right now is $75. I mean, for the components, it's not worth $75. For the gameplay, maybe. I could see maybe I could see picking this up. I mean, I mean it's a small box, right? It looks like the equivalent of Race of the Galaxy, which is a $40 game. It's decks of cards and a little kind of major, kind of a little larger card where you can kind of stick your cards in, kind of like um, Seven Wonders. So, you know, you put the cards on the knees uh, yeah, and yeah. left and the right, and that's basically a little, a little tableau building in that way. Yeah, yeah but, I mean, I've wanted to try this for a while. I know a lot of other people really like it. It's uh, hard to find. Um, but maybe next time we're at a 20-sided store, I know they have a copy. I want to play this again, and I want to pick this up, so they really should throw this on Kickstarter again, because it's a lot of fun, and it really... I For me, as much as I love Race for the Galaxy, I like this better. All right, so that's everything at the table this week. Next up, we're going to talk about our feature review, and that's Thunder Alley. <laughs> and now for the feature review. Alright, so the feature review this week is Thunder Alley. This is a new game from GMT. Uh, it doesn't quite fit their normal theme of war games and revolutions and civil wars across the history of the last two centuries, but it is uh, looks and feels very much like a GMT game uh, in terms of production and what comes in the box and the chits and the rules. And we had a lot of fun punching out all the little chits. Yeah, was... yeah, I, I didn't do my duty. I came, I brought the, <laughs> I brought the game to the game night unpunched. Um, <laughs> That's a faux pas on you, man. Yeah, I know. We have rules here. Gamer sin. <laughs> um, but the game itself is... It's NASCAR. Obviously, they don't have the license, but it is stock car racing uh, done as a board game. And it's more of a strategy game based on cards that allow you to move different amounts. The game is very much based on um, this team mechanic because you're going to have between three and six cars, I believe, depending on how many players are playing, and it plays three to seven, so you have a lot of options there. Or two to seven, probably. And you want to get the highest score from all of those. So it doesn't matter if you win the race, if the rest of your cars are at the back of the pack, because someone else is going to get a better average. Um, to do this, you're going to use various cards that you draw to move any one of your cars at any time. The cool mechanic here is that they can draft with each other. So there are there's lead movement, there's pursuit movement, and then there's straight drafting movement. So cars behind you, cars in front of you, or cars both behind you and in front of you will move with you. So you can move a whole line of cards if you want, um, but of course the negative part of that is that your opponents might be in that line as well with your other cars. So you have to decide who you're going to move, when you're going to move them, how to cut other people off, how to push them back. You can take their space, you know, move them out a little bit. Um, you're almost certainly going to have to pit at some point. You get wear tokens based on which cards you play. Uh, some of them are permanent, some of them are temporary, but if you get enough of them, you go slower. And if you get even more than that, if you get six, that car is removed from the race entirely. So you have to balance that a little bit. When are you going to pit any two, three, or four lap race to make sure that you can make a sprint at the end, but that you don't lose so much time uh, because of it? The game, to me at least, felt... Um, very heavily based on this drafting mechanic, which is very thematic to stock car racing, um, but it's definitely not, you're not trying to win the race with any one car. So winning definitely helps, but <laughs> you're not just necessarily trying to win the race. Uh, despite the long rule book and all the chits, the rules are pretty simple. I think we taught them about 10, 15 minutes, got started pretty quickly. Um, definitely a lot of chits on the board. We'll talk about that a little bit more in terms of components and artwork, but um, 
out of the box, you are getting four tracks. There's two full-size boards, double-sided, so there's a lot of replayability there. There is season play in the book, so if you want to play multiple games and do points over the course of a season, um, and then some variants in terms of who goes first and how you deal with pits and different kinds of damage. Uh, if you don't like the way it's done by default, you can tweak that a little based on the rule book. Um, now we'll dive right in, I guess, and talk about who liked what and how, and um, I'll hold my opinion a little bit longer. But uh, let's see what you guys think of the game, Thunder Alley. I love the idea of a race game. Um, I go, my history goes back to Speed Circuit, the old 3M game. And t- to me, every time I see a game with its Formula D, uh, it all seems like just basic variations, uh, a way to tweak it, a way to improve the game, uh, the original Speed Circuit. And... So in that sense, I think every game, every race game is worthy, but there are enough of them, a half dozen good ones out there that, man, you really have to think, is this worth it? Is this enough of a, of a difference? And I don't think the, the war game treatment is good for a race game with all the little chits and, you know, the feel of it is very much like a GMT game, which is cool. The best part about GMT game as the rule book, which is laid out very easy to follow. It's all outlined, beautiful. It's just the manipulation. I don't think it works for a racing game. I, I don't like to see my little race cars as square pieces of cardboard going around a, a rectangular pieces of cardboard going around a track. Um, it just doesn't feel like what a race game should be. And so it was, it was uh, underwhelming for me. For me, I would never pick this game up. Just the idea of a NASCAR game is so counterintuitive to being able to enter a whole universe where there's all these different possibilities and all these great games and all these great themes. NASCAR. All right. Make a laugh. Make a laugh. Make a laugh. (laughs) So looking at this game, it would just never come off the shelf for me. Playing this game was surprisingly interesting. I didn't think I was going to like this game when I saw the the pile of tr- chits out there as Drew was mentioning I was like wow this went from I don't want to play this to I'm going to be bored out of my mind and when we started playing it I actually had fun with the game the chits made sense the cars while I did probably want a little micro machine car there it was actually pretty decent as far as the graphic design and the artwork was concerned the cards themselves that you would be playing throughout the game that kind of talks about the drafting mechanic whether you're kind of pushing people forward taking people from behind or both or none it actually made sense and it was a game that i kind of got into and i i was really surprised about that and the artwork on the board was really nice and i really want to play this again it's a play for me really i was much closer to drew there is i think the rules were nicely laid out but I think the way that the game was built included a lot of impediments to enjoyment. Things like little kits you had to keep track of and pile up. I don't think the board or the pieces were very attractive, which I know is the style of, of this particular company to some extent, but that's not an excuse. That's just a reason, right? And it was still not very superficially attractive. The map was actually, the racetrack was actually rather attractive, but. The things you were moving, the kits you had to pick up, they were all kind of just bland cardboard squares or rectangles in the case of the cars. Um, yeah, I could, I could see why they had so many different chits. Um, there were eight different colored chits for problems that your car would have. Four of them were temporary, four permanent. I like the mechanic of temporary that you can get rid of, permanent you can't. But they were important because you had the event cards every turn where you turn one over and sometimes if you had this many blue card, or blue chits, then you had to turn in a temporary uh, bad thing for a permanent bad thing. It just made for a lot of, a, a lot of fiddly yeah. stuff that I didn't see was necessary. There was more bookkeeping than there needed to be in a ah, game like yeah, this. Yeah. yeah, and that was unfortunate because I, like, I really liked the core mechanic of the game. I thought it was a really good implementation of strategy within a racing game because most racing games are, um, not most, just the ones I played are, you know, they focus mostly on that speed aspect. So, you mm-hmm. have, like Formula D, you're just you're shifting up, you're trying to get the bigger dice so you can go further. 
And I like Formula D a lot, but the people who don't, I understand why they don't. <laughs> it's, it's roll and move. Um, the strategy doesn't really come in as much in that game, even if you ramp up to the higher difficulty levels. Uh, this game was very strategic because you had to decide when to play your cards, what card you're going to hold, because maybe it'll be good later. Um, one thing, there was a card called Clean Air that if you ended in a space, a sector with nobody in it, you could keep going until you ran into one with somebody in it. So the multiple times I would hold that card waiting for the people in front of me to move so I could get bonus movement off of that. Mm, yeah. So it's like I'm not in drafting position, so I'm not going to go with them, but if I wait and play this card at the right time, I can make up a lot of ground really quickly and not get lapped, which is kind of the yeah. goal there. So stuff like that is really cool to me, and I don't see that in other racing games as much. Um, Formula D is all about the experience of rolling those dice and crashing into walls. Uh, games like Longshot are more about the betting than they are about the racing, that there's no strategy there except in the betting that you're doing, which is a completely different type of game. Uh, this one is about racing those cars, and it felt to me it felt very thematic in the mechanics. If you watch NASCAR and everybody's like, oh, I'm going around in a circle, uh, circle, but there's a lot of mechanics to it. There's a lot of science to it. There's like, when do you go in and drafting will, you use a little less fuel and you go a little bit faster and that matters because it might get you an extra lap. Um, staying on the inside keeps your tires a little fresher. Uh, knowing when to pit, when not to pit. Those are parts of this game and I thought it worked really well in that sense. The problem being that there's so many chits and you do yeah. spend, there was a lot of downtime between each person's action moving all the cars because you just drafted six cars with you, <laughs> picking up whatever chits you're getting, keeping track of them on your board. Um, I would agree with that. I didn't like that as much. The mechanics are thematic. They're, I'll, I'll agree there, but they're still problematic in, in the mirror image of why Formula D is problematic. Um, it's, what's this game? Thunder Alley is a strategy game about hand management. It's not a yes. simulation. It's a hand management game. Yeah. yeah. There's something about Formula D that feels like a simulation where you have gears, you're shifting up and down, and your your speed varies based on what gear you're in, but then you're rolling a die, which just blows the whole simulation sky high. It's way too much randomness. So you've got one game where the randomness is, is too varied with rolling a die, and then Thunder Alley where there's too much randomness in what cards you get. So neither really feels right as a as a race game because there's way too much randomness. The, yeah, the deck does bring randomness as far as it would be interesting if you if your driver or your team had special abilities that kind of played a little bit into it. Yeah. Or if you played a driver and they had a, a specific deck for them and then maybe there was more of a deck drafting or deck building type of mechanic where cards kind of went around like you decided to kind of take the inside lane so I took a different card which moved me to the outside lane but I was really impressed with the fact that the strategy in the game on which cards to play when and where to move your cards you know in a certain sequence or I think towards the end of the game I was trying to get behind Daniel which yeah. typically if you play a game you want to move your, your guys ahead of the other guys here you really want it. the positioning is really important because I'm I'm kind of getting an idea that maybe Daniel's going to play a drafting car which is going to pull my car along my car has already made its move so I really do need to tail somebody else there or if I want to bump someone's car I got to be really careful about that because my tire is about to go out you know I might want to go a little bit slower which means I won't have to pit but now I'm going a little bit slower so the only downside for me was I didn't see enough event cards in the game, yeah. and I really wanted to see a lot more event cards, and I actually wanted to see some crashes, because <laughs> yeah. at least in a game, it doesn't hurt anybody, so I wanted to see, I think there was two cards in the game, at least, that did that, so I wanted to see more event cards, but yeah. I like the strategy element to it, and it made me appreciate NASCAR, which I thought nothing would ever <laughs> do, ever. The drafting was interesting there. Yeah, I mean, I think the core mechanic is actually pretty solid, but I think the game got in its own way so many times in so many ways that it just started to really weigh down on that core mechanic. Keeping tra All this bookkeeping that didn't need to be there, the relatively uncharismatic pieces and kits and all of that. <laughs> um, I did want to see more event cards, because again, that was another aspect of the mechanics that could have really had something nice added to it. Uh, so in the end, I think it got in its own way so much that ended up being a dodge for me. I mean, it's not a game that I regret playing or would never play again. It's just if there were that game and any other game I enjoy on the table, 
and pick the other game. So it you would, just doesn't matter. You would dodge this game yeah. because otherwise, if you were in the same lane as it, you'd be dragged along to play it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for me, it ends up being a dodge, and it's not. Again, like the core mechanic is solid, and part of my resent for this game is that the game should have been really good built on that core mechanic because it's an interesting idea of the team race, right? It should have been fantastic, and it just floundered. It was such a great core concept. I think the, the the team part worked for me in a way that you know Formula D has teams and some variations, but it, it just doesn't doesn't make make a difference. This has a good team concept. If they were able to build like a lead driver onto this, I think Chris, you mentioned something about yeah. variable powers. You have one driver that has a, a greater ability. He's your lead driver, and then the other team supports him. Um, you could play around with that, make it more of a strategy game. Or maybe even if you hand it out, you kind of split the deck in the beginning, and then you had a ch- whatever cards you played, that was it. So if you're gonna, mm-hmm. you know, if you're gonna have this major kind of like drafting opportunity, you can play maybe once or twice or three times in a game, but that's it. So yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Would you would you play it again, Drew? Or would you dodge it? No, I would dodge it. And okay. uh, the, uh, i, I got to throw some information here. This is why. I would rather try playing this again in a new, f- again in a new form. Oh, the, are we talking a mashup? No. The designers, Jeff and Carla Borger, are working on a Grand Prix game. Okay. Very similar to this, but changing the rules slightly to adjust from NASCAR to Grand Prix. Uh, yes. And I imagine that the... Um, but basically, they admitted that the things that they learned from this game, they're going to implement in the next game. So... That's good. And now it's they... going to play for more people. It's going to still be a team game. They said, I've integrated the lessons learned from Thunder Alley into the unique flavor of Formula One racing and created a similar and yet wholly unique experience. Well, if they've corrected the mistakes, I'd rather wait for their improvement. <laughs> it's basically a re-implementation. So next year, uh, look for Grand Prix. And I will be willing to give that a try. I want to see what they've, yeah. how they've tinkered with that. Sure. I think everything was implemented really well. And... Uh, it, the result was a fun game that felt very much like the sport. Um, if you don't like the sport, I don't know if you like the game. I, that, well, that was true of me. I didn't like the sport, but I liked the game. All right, well, I'll take that back. You <laughs> could like this game a lot if you don't like the sport. Um, I don't, I'm not going to give it a buy for a few reasons. I don't think it's a game that's going to fit in with a lot of situations. Um, I don't see when I'd pull this out unless I know for a fact people would like this kind of game in advance. I don't think um, it plays particularly quickly just because of the amount of fiddly bits you got to deal with. That can drag things out a little. Moving stuff around the track takes a while. And I don't know, like, long-term, if you played it, like, eight times, which, you know, that's the situation in which you would buy you'd play it multiple times, I don't know how much different it's going to be over time. I mean, you have four tracks, and they're different. It's NASCAR. I mean, so you're still just going around. <laughs> <laughs> Left yeah. turns. Yeah. <laughs> Every game's going to be different, but at the same time, it's, it's going to... I think there might be some issues there, because you have the same cards. And the only thing that's going to change is the event cards, which you still only see four of, so... Well, they're longer tracks. Some of the others are very long tracks. They're only two laps instead of three, which means if you get a yellow card, it's a huge change. I mean, yellow cards change the whole pace of the game, the whole tenor of it. I think this game is screaming. Yellow flags, I mean. Yeah, I think this game is screaming for somebody on Board Game Geek to throw up a variant where you get more event cards in and maybe even some company coming in, maybe like Litco, and kind of upgrading the components because mm-hmm. be nice. I would love to see your car and maybe like a... We talked about a pegboard, Drew. Yeah, pegboard. Where instead of having like a little chip kind of placed on to show damage or temporary damage, you know, a pegboard, you know, placed in the tire. That a little more thematic as far as that's concerned. Because I think this game has... I think everything in the box is in a place where if you just played with it a little bit, you could get a lot more out of it. Yeah, yeah I can yeah. see that. Lead driver, special powers. Yeah. That wouldn't be my addition. <laughs> We're like describing a whole new game. Yeah. <laughs> He's like taking notes. <laughs> you store some machine guns on those cars. <laughs> and one final plug for Speed Circuit. The first, the original auto racing game. If you find it at a thrift store, buy it. <laughs> Or if you like NASCAR, buy Thunder Alley, because I still think it's a great game. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's our feature review for this week. Yeah. All right, now over to Drew for the final round. Our final round today celebrates World Space Week, which really focuses on the use of space, the development of space, outreach, education. Uh, some really heavy name scientists are, are behind this. 
And there are a whole lot of games which are all about space. You know, I, I saw this phrase. In fact, part of the, the purpose of World Space Week is to educate people about the benefits they receive and encourage the use of space for sustainable economic development. There is no game which screams sustainable economic development louder than Race for the Galaxy, which is all about two, three, four players, which is a great hand management game and economic building game of creating worlds, settling worlds, and creating and settling developments to build an economic chain to create more settlements to, to grow and outreach and build an empire in space. It can be military, it can be peaceful. It's pretty much a multiplayer solitaire game, but it's also a race. You're trying to be the first to get a certain number of developments in space and end up with the most victory points at the same time. So you're always watching what the other guy's playing. You're trying to rush. This is not a lackadaisical game. So really for people that play, that know the game, it plays very quickly and you can play another game right away. There's some great expansions, I won't get into it, but the basic game, Race for the Galaxy, is a lot of fun. Well, so this one isn't so much about the economics, but about you know space exploration and still. My, my favorite space-themed game is still Gravwell. Uh, partially has a special place in my heart because I think it's still not very well known, or at least not as well known as it deserves to be, because I think it's one of the most uh, interesting and innovative racing games I've ever played. Um, so, that's my I, like fourth push for Gravwell. <laughs> no, I haven't played it yet. But ah, I... push. Ah, ah push. See. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a pun there. I see what you I did there. Of, yeah. That was awesome. I haven't played it yet, but I keep reading of it with respect. Like it's you know a really a sleeper game. Yeah, I, I don't think I've played with anyone who didn't enjoy it. Usually the first couple rounds are rough because people are still trying to figure out exactly how to manipulate the forces of gravity here right, and to slingshot around one another. Oh, okay. And the, because the racing, the mechanics are really unusual, the way you move. Um, but once people figure out the rules, everyone seems to really love it. Well, you got to bring it out for us. Yeah, sure. There are so many great space games, and one of the great things about gaming is about playing only space themes. So yeah. if you're looking for fantasy, you might want to look at X-Wing Miniatures or Star Trek Attack Wing, where you actually get these nice ships and be able to fly them in formation. If you're looking for dice rolling and more of a Euro game, you can look at Alien Frontiers, which actually allows you to manage the different economic resources in a classic sci-fi theme. Now, if you're looking for your epic kind of space games you might want to look at eclipse or twilight Imperium 3 which lets you do everything now it's going to take you a universe amount of time to be able to do all these things but there are so many different flavors to sci-fi and a lot of fun ways to capture it it'll keep you playing until next year's space week huh absolutely <laughs> okay all right so that's everything for this week don't forget to follow us on facebook and twitter find us on twitter at pga podcast we're on board game geek as well and uh, boardgamersanonymous.com lots and lots of good stuff on there including the extra life information that you're looking for all right that's everything for me this is anthony this is chris this is daniel and this is drew and until next week we'll save you a spot in the draft you don't have a choice you don't know how the drafts work you're coming with us you're